I'd like to thank Hunt a Killer for sponsoring today's episode. A long-time unsolved disappearance transforms into a haunting cold case homicide when Julia Adler accidentally discovers the decomposed body of a legendary actress from the 1930s in a theatre that's been in the Adler family for generations. The theatre's brooding board of directors attempt to thwart Julia out of their future, the theatre's reputation takes a turn for the worst, and thus Julia is left with no choice but to appoint you as lead investigator. This spine-chilling synopsis is just one of many mysterious storylines provided by Hunt, a killer, delivering a treasure trove of masterful narratives and interactive cold cases once a month through their subscription-based one-of-a-kind game. You don't have to go diving into the darkest parts of the web to find bizarre and intriguing true crime stories, because creative cases like the Julia Adler files are delivered right to your home. There are genuine audio recordings, suspect profiles, crime scene maps, murder weapon documents, and so many more physical clues packed into every murder mystery adventure. It's an experience unlike any other, like a true crime inspired escape room built in your very own home. Part of the proceeds from every Hunter Killer subscription box is awarded to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization relentless in assisting investigations with real-world cold cases. This means a lot to us, as our mission is first and foremost to bring awareness to victims and their families. If you want to hunt a killer, you can go to hunterkiller.com slash coldcasedetective and use the code CCD for 20% off your first box. Again, use the code CCD for a 20% discount and show your support for the channel and those affected by cold cases around the world. Together, let us shine some light on the darkness as we hunt a killer. Thanks to the advancements in modern technology, it's getting easier and easier for authorities to locate anyone, an unidentified criminal, an anonymous web user, or a sinister phone caller. But it wasn't always this way. Back in the 1970s and 80s, it was much harder for authorities to gain leads from these phone calls, to the point that the phone became a direct line to a victim's life, a way to torment and terrify, with the criminal safe and seemingly untouchable on the other end of the wire. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be exploring two cold cases that revolve around these mysterious, terrifying phone calls. Cynthia Anderson When James Rabbit entered his office on the morning of August 4th, 1981, he immediately knew something was amiss. The radio was playing, the lights and the air conditioning were on, and his desk, along with those of the other lawyers of his office, was prepared for the day ahead. But his legal secretary, 20-year-old Cynthia Jane Anderson, who went by Cindy, was nowhere to be seen. According to her loved ones, Cindy was a bright and generous young woman. She lived and worked in Ohio and was a devout Christian fundamentalist, along with the rest of her family with whom she lived. She was known to enjoy her job at the offices of lawyers James Rabbit and Jay Fieldstein on East Manhattan Boulevard, but did have intentions of leaving in two weeks so she could go to Bible College with her new boyfriend. As a result, her sudden, unexplained disappearance was considered to be strange and uncharacteristic. The morning that Cindy vanished from her workplace, she left no note to let her employers know that she was simply stepping out or running an errand. Authorities discovered that although her keys and handbag were gone, her car was still in its usual spot in the parking lot. She'd also left behind her romance novel, which sat open on her desk. Upon checking Cindy's finances, investigators found that she'd left a healthy sum of money behind in her account. Neither her bank account nor her social security number has ever been used since she vanished. 
Upon speaking to her parents, her father noted that Cindy had recently been taking great care in her appearance, although this could be down to her having a new boyfriend. He also said that she had been skipping out on breakfast most mornings. While these things could be construed as odd, they were not necessarily cause for alarm. However, more concerning information was about to come to light. After asking around, law enforcement discovered several peculiar and disturbing pieces of information. To begin, they found out that for the past year, Cindy had been suffering from a recurring nightmare in which she was abducted and attacked by a man. Not only this, but at work she had been receiving odd phone calls, which caused her much distress. A colleague at her workplace told authorities that the day before she went missing, the 20-year-old received a phone call that upset her. When asked what was wrong, Cindy explained that this wasn't the first unsettling call she'd received. The unknown caller contacted her twice while the colleague was present. Earlier that year, Cindy's employers had installed an emergency buzzer at her desk, and she had become very particular about making certain the office door was locked at all times due to the calls she was receiving and the nightmares she was having. The crime scene was a baffling one to investigators. Although they had some worrying information to go off, the office showed no signs of a disturbance and there was no forced entry. No calls were answered after 10 a.m., suggesting that it was around this time that something happened to Cindy. Another lead in the case came in the form of writing on a wall near her workplace, which read, I love you, Cindy, by GW, written by an unidentified man. The 20-year-old had noticed the writing 10 months before going missing. It was there for six months until it was covered up, but after a few weeks, it reappeared. Cindy was noted to have been extremely disturbed by this, understandably. It was initially unknown if the writing had anything to do with her disappearance, with the police investigating and clearing several men with the initials GW, including one maintenance worker for the building. However, the writer has since been identified and is not believed to be involved with Cindy's disappearance. Reportedly, he wrote the message for another woman named Cindy. Then, in September of 1981, law enforcement received a chilling anonymous tip that claimed Cindy was being held against her will. The caller was nervous and refused to give her name, but told authorities that the 20-year-old was being kept in the basement of a white house and that there were two houses side by side that were owned by the same family. Reportedly, the family were on holiday, but their son remained, and it was he who was holding Cindy captive. The caller would not give an address and hung up when the investigator on the other end pressed her for more information. Although she did call back a few months later, she hung up once more when another member of law enforcement attempted to listen in on the call. The unidentified tipster has not called back since, and the validity of her tip is unknown. It seems that police never located the houses that she spoke about. Just another mysterious phone call in a case with far too many. One of the most talked about aspects of this case is the account that Cindy's romance novel was left open at a page where an abduction was taking place in the story. It is apparently the only violent encounter that the book contains. For some, this seems like a clue that was intentionally left behind, but others have wondered how likely it would be that Cindy just happened to be on that page on the day she vanished. It's even less likely that she managed to flip to the correct page before being abducted. The book has never been named in reports, so it's impossible for anyone to look for themselves at exactly what this could mean, with some online sleuths believing it's a hint left by an abductor, and many believing it's simply a red herring. Over the years, there have been several suspects in Cindy's case, and none of them has ever been officially ruled out. Two convicted killers, Anthony and Nathaniel Cook, who killed nine people between them in Ohio during the 1980s, have long since been suspected of being involved, but have repeatedly denied being entangled in this case. Another convicted killer, who has not been named but is serving time in prison in Ohio, is also suspected of having been involved in the case. However, no concrete link has ever been made between this man and Cindy. One of the most compelling theories is that which involves a lawyer at the firm Cindy worked for, a man named Richard Neller. 
He represented a drug dealer named Jose Rodriguez Jr., and the police theorized that perhaps Cindy overheard the two discussing Jose's criminal activity, and she was therefore silenced. In 1995, an informant testified at Jose's trial, claiming that he had confessed to killing the 20-year-olds, but the informant's testimony was ruled as unreliable. Both Jose and Richard were later convicted and imprisoned on drug offenses. It's also noted that shortly after Cindy disappeared, nine people were indicted on drug trafficking charges. Law enforcement suspects that at least one of them could know something about the disappearance, but so far, no new leads have turned up in the case. Outside of these theories, there is very little speculation. Most true crime enthusiasts suggest that perhaps Cindy left of her own volition. They reached this conclusion by pointing out that the office doors were locked that morning, that there were no signs of a struggle, and that the book was intentionally left behind by the 20-year-old. It is a comforting thought, but others have disputed the idea. They point to the fact that she appeared to have very little to no money on her, and her bank account had been left untouched. If she'd run away to start over, she'd require connections for a new social security number and a decent amount of money. The only other theory proposed in her case is that Cindy was extremely paranoid and suffering from an undiagnosed mental illness. Online users have questioned whether or not she really received harassing phone calls, or if she was the victim of her own anxiety and possible psychosis. Cindy's parents never moved away or changed phone numbers. Her mother passed away in 1983, while her father followed 25 years later in 2008. If she is still alive, Sydney would be 59 years old. If you have any information, no matter how small, about Cindy, her whereabouts, or her abduction, you can reach the Toledo Police Department on 419-245-3340. Amy Billig. Described as a vibrant and talented girl, 17-year-old Amy Billig enjoyed writing poetry, reading books, playing both the guitar and the flute, and being a proud animal rights activist. By all accounts, she was popular and well-liked, which made it unusual and particularly heartbreaking when she went missing from Miami, Florida in 1974. On Tuesday, March 5th of 1974, Amy had plans to go out with her friends. But first, she needed money, so she headed along Main Highway in her neighborhood of Coconut Grove in search of a lift to her father's workplace, an art gallery, where she intended to ask for a loan of some cash. Although most of us know better than to hitchhike alone nowadays, Amy felt safe in the neighborhood, and while the gallery was within walking distance, she had hitchhiked multiple times before, and so she was used to it and had no reason to fear that this trip would turn out to be any different than the dozens she'd taken before. But tragically, this time would be different indeed. Amy never made it to the workplace of Ned Belig, her father. She also never made it to the meeting with her friends later that day. Nobody had seen Amy, and no one had heard from her. Her parents quickly informed authorities, and an investigation was launched into the missing teenager's case. Early on in the initial investigation, the Billig family were approached by someone they thought was Amy's abductor. Over the phone, the perpetrator asked for $30,000 in exchange for the 17-year-old's safe return but authorities soon learned that the caller was two 16-year-old boys, twins, named Charles and Larry Glasser. They were opportunists who had nothing to do with the case and had no idea as to Amy's whereabouts. Unfortunately, they wasted precious time and resources that could have been better spent. They were ultimately charged with extortion. While the police continued to look for clues, Susan Billig, Amy's mother, conducted her own extensive investigation, following up on tips and leads wherever she could. Her inquiry led her up and down the country, and she even traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to the United Kingdom in her attempts to locate her missing daughter. Among the tips that Susan and law enforcement received was the notion that Amy had been picked up and abducted by one of two biker gangs who had been traveling through the area at the time. 
One was known as the Pagans, while the other known as the Outlaws. Sources pertaining to Amy's case reference both gangs. Most focus on the Pagans, but both were equally dangerous, dealing in drugs, guns, and sex workers. Susan took hold of this potential lead and ran with it, searching desperately for any sign of her child. A family friend who had done some legal work for the Pagans managed to set up a meeting between Susan, Ned, and two members of the group. The couple learned during this meeting that these particular members hadn't seen their daughter, but it was frequent for gang participants to buy, sell, and exchange young women they had abducted either for monetary gain or for material goods, such as new bikes. The members assured the Billigs that they would look into Amy's disappearance by asking around about her, but they never found any further information, or if they did, they never let the family know. Three months after the vanishing, Susan tracked the bikers down to Orlando, Florida. A convenience store manager here claimed that he recognized Amy as a girl who had been with the group. She was last seen with at least two members of the gang and had come into the store on several occasions to buy vegetable soup as she was a vegetarian. Although this gave the family and law enforcement some hope, it sadly led nowhere. No new leads were picked up until a year and a half later in January of 1976, when a man known as Dave called Susan and admitted that he used to, quote, own her daughter. He agreed to talk at his house, but acted nervous about the mother's arrival, concerned that she had been followed. Upon looking at Amy's photograph, he confirmed that this was the girl he used to own. He described her as extremely quiet, like a mute, and also noted her appendectomy scar, which had not been made public at the time. Dave agreed to look into Amy's whereabouts, and a few weeks later, he and Susan traveled to Oklahoma, where it was believed the teenager was being held. In June, they arrived at a pub where Amy was supposedly meant to be delivered to the pair, but instead, a fight broke out, and Dave was injured. Susan was whisked away to safety by several other bikers. She never saw Dave again, although at some point later, he told her lawyer that Amy was likely in Seattle. In November of 1977, Susan traveled to Seattle, despite having recently suffered a heart attack. She asked around, brandishing the photo of her daughter to the clients and staff in bars, clubs, tattoo parlors, and motorcycle shops, and had several witnesses claim to have seen Amy. Once more, she was described as being like a mute. Several years later, in winter of 1979, an anonymous male called the family and told Susan that Amy was at a truck stop outside of Reno, Nevada, and that she needed help. Although the FBI confirmed that the biker gang passed through there, they could not confirm that the young woman was with them. Across the course of this entire investigation, only one piece of evidence was recovered. Amy's camera was located at the Wildwood exit on a toll road known as Florida's Turnpike. It was found shortly after the teenager disappeared and was turned in by a man who heard she was missing. This exit would have been on the route the biker gang took while heading north. It is unknown if Amy had the camera on her at the time she went missing. It may have been lost beforehand. Sadly, nothing substantial was recovered from the camera. Most of the photos that were developed were overexposed, while another simply showed a white van, giving investigators nothing to go on. During the late 1970s, a member of the Pagans named Paul Branch came forward to tell Susan that Amy was his girlfriend and that he had lived with her for a while after purchasing her in Orlando. He said he was arrested a year later and left Amy with his roommate, but when he was released from prison, he found both of them gone along with his motorbike. At some point, Branch also mentioned to Susan that her daughter was alive and being held by other members of the gang. However, after he passed away in the 1990s, Branch's widow claimed that he had recanted this confession on his deathbed and told her that Amy had attended a party with the pagans on the night of her disappearance. Upon becoming rude and mouthy, she was allegedly raped but fought back, so she was forcibly given drugs until her heart gave out. Her body was reportedly disposed of in the Florida Everglades. 
Although this tragic and brutal tale might seem possible at first, it was later revealed that the widow had taken money from a documentary crew in exchange for sharing her story. Susan and the widow were filmed meeting by the crew. The validity of the claim was thrown into question as a result of the involvement of money. Many online sleuths and police investigators don't believe the story. It seems possible that the widow fabricated this information for the cash and attention it brought. That said, some of the details of the party described were confirmed by investigators, but those pertaining to the young woman's fate were not. Despite all of the confusion and the red herrings, we've yet to discuss perhaps the darkest and cruelest element that haunted the family during their investigation. Shortly after Amy went missing, her parents began to receive strange, disturbing phone calls from an anonymous male caller. He claimed that Amy had been abducted by members of an illicit sex ring organization and was being held captive. He described in detail what was being done to her. The caller tormented the family for 21 years until 1995 when the FBI traced one of the calls to a man who used a mobile phone. Up until that point, the caller had used payphones, which had made it difficult to trace and apprehend him. The twisted individual who'd spent over two decades causing the family distress was revealed to be a man named Henry Johnson Blair, who worked for the United States Customs Department. He claimed that he was an alcoholic and that he had OCD, which had caused him to continually harass the family. A feeble excuse for the devastating pain he caused from his disturbing words. Blair claimed that he didn't know anything about Amy's vanishing and didn't know the girl personally. However, this statement came into question when law enforcement noticed the details of a man described in the teenager's journal. Amy wrote about a man named Hank, who she was considering running away with, as he had asked her to go to South America with him. Reportedly, Blair went by the nickname Hank, and his job required him to relocate to South America. He also had a van that matched the color and model of the one shown in the photographs retrieved from Amy's camera. Despite these odd coincidences, Blair was never conclusively tied to Amy's case. In the end, Blair spent just two years in prison for harassing the family for two decades, and Susan settled a lawsuit against him for $5 million. In 1992, the hopes of the Billig family were raised once again when Susan was contacted by a private investigator who was working on Amy's case with a British investigator who explained that while in Falmouth, England, he was approached by an American biker who was looking to sell a young woman. She was also American and described as a mute. However, he did not show a picture and the British investigator passed away just a year later, resulting in the lead becoming a dead end. Fresh leads in Amy's case are scarce and theories are very limited. Most online sleuths are in either one of two camps, that the biker gang knows something and is keeping quiet or that Henry Johnson Blair knows something and is keeping quiet. Many argue how unlikely it would be for so many people to know the fate of the teenager and for not one person to come forward, while others feel that the bikers were simply messing around with a grieving family for kicks. On the other hand, some people believe Blair had nothing to do with the case, but was simply a sick and twisted individual who got some sort of thrill in hurting Amy's family while others believe that the possible connection between him, the van Amy photographed and her journal are too big of a coincidence to be ignored. Unfortunately, neither of Amy's parents will ever see justice for their missing child. Ned passed away in the early 90s after a battle with lung cancer, while Susan lived until she was 80 years old, passing away in 2005. Before her death, she co-wrote a book about her daughter's vanishing titled Without a Trace, The Disappearance of Amy Billig, A Mother's Search for Justice. Amy's case was also featured on Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted. Sadly, to this day, her disappearance remains unsolved. If Amy is still alive, she would be 63 years old. During her time with the biker gang, she may have used the alias's mute, 
Sunshine, Little Bits, and Mellow Cheryl. If you have any information in regards to Amy's whereabouts or her abduction, you can reach the authorities on 305 476 5423. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also join the Cold Case Detective Discord if you want to delve further into the mystery with me, the rest of the team, and our entire Cold Case community. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.